Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel. I've done a thing. I have here a mystery box of around 30 books that I got on eBay. They're all paperbacks, they're all fiction. I have no idea what's in them and I thought it'd be fun just to take a punt and have a look. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put three piles. I'm going to have a pile for books I haven't read, which I'm going to potentially keep and read and add them to my already huge physical TBR of 420 something or I'm going to put them in a separate pile which is books I've read and they're going to go straight to be donated to my charity shop and then behind me there's going to be a pile of ones that I'm really not sure whether or not I've read so I'm going to get this box open and I'll get and have a look okay I've got the box open I'm really excited so we've got some packaging Ooh. and we've got a little note Little cow, that's a thank you. Very sweet. Thank you for your purchase. Now, I'll say this box costs about £14, including shipping. So each book costs around 75 pence each. The cat is over here somewhere, so she might move. Let's have a look. So we've got I'm Watching You by Karen Rose. Star prosecutor for the Chicago Public Defender's Office, Kristen Mayhew is no stranger to success. But even she cannot always secure a conviction. It's therefore only a matter of time before she herself becomes the victim. Kristen has a secret admirer who follows her every move and seems to know her every thought. He kills the criminals she herself is powerless to stop and then sends her letters offering her the murderers as, to murders as token of her respect. Ooh. Kristen's life is out of control. As the body count rises, the killer's obsessive need for retribution will make Kristen a target, along with everyone she holds dear. I love Karen Rose. So yeah, excellent. Then we've got John Le Carre, Absolute Friends. It's actually in quite good condition. Ted Mundy, British soldier's son, born in 1947 in a shiny new independent Pakistan. And Sasha, refugee son of an East German Lutheran pastor, first became friends as students in riot torn West Berlin in the late 60s. They meet again in the grimy looking glass of Cold War espionage and most terribly in today's unipopular Unipolar world of terror, counter terror, and the world of lies. Oh, nice. Minette Waters, Acid Row, or Row, Acid Row, I'd say. Um, Acid Row, the name the beleaguered inhabitants give to the place they live. A no man's land of single mothers, fatherless children, where angry, alienated teenagers control the streets. Into this ba ba battleground comes Sophie Morrison, a young doctor visiting a patient in Acid Row. Little does she know she's entering the home of a known paedophile. Ooh. And with a report circulating that a tormented child called Amy has disappeared, the vigilantes are out in force. Soon Sophie is trapped in the centre of a terrifying siege with a man she's come to despise. Whipped to a frenzy by unsubstantiated rumour, the mob unleashes its hatred against authority, the law and the pervert. Protecting Amy becomes the catch-all defence for the terrible events that follow, and if murder is part of it, then so be it. That sounds good. So far, I haven't read any of these. So that's, let me just put that away, a plus. The next one is Ruth Rendell. Uh, put on by Cunning. This is a nice slim book. It's not going to take long to read that one. Look at this. It's very old. Um, so a Wexford mystery. So Sir Manuel Carmoog is one of the greatest flautist, flautists of his time was dead. Misadventure. An old man ankle deep in snow. He lost his foothold in the dark slipping into water to be trapped under a lid of ice. Only a glove remained to point to where he lay. One of its fingers rising out of the drifts. Sounds creepy. There's nothing Chief Inspector Wexford likes better than an open and shut case. They're so restful. And yet there are one or two niggling doubts and the stir disturbing return of Carmoog's, I can't pronounce his name, daughter, now a considerable heiress after an absence of 19 years. Is Wexford going to listen to that nagging inner voice of his? And if he does, what exactly does he plan to do? Ooh, that sounds good. So again, I haven't read this one. Oh, Jeffrey Archer. I've never read any Jeffrey Archer, so that'll be a first. A Prisoner of Birth. If Danny Cartwright had proposed to Beth Wilson the day before or the day after, he would not have been arrested and charged with the murder of his best friend. Oh! 
And when the four prosecution witnesses are a barrister, a popular actor, an aristocrat, and the youngest partner in an established firm's history, who is going to believe his side of the story? Danny is sentenced to 22 years and sent to Belmarsh Prison, the highest security jail in the land, from where no inmate has ever escaped. But everyone has underestimated Danny's determination to seek revenge and best resentment quest to win justice. Actually, I've never thought Geoffrey Archer would be interested. Um, you know, he has a reputation. Um, and, do you know what? That sounds really good. So we're, we're like, what, five books in and, and I haven't read one yet. So it's all looking, looking, oh, this is uh, Lisa Moore, February. Long listed for the Man Booker Prize 2010. Probably the book I would normally, all right. Oh, this one's only got praise on the back. Let's see if we can find what it's about. In 1982, the oil rig Ocean Ranger sank off the coast of Newfoundland during a Valentine's Night storm. In the early hour of the next morning, all 84 men aboard died. Helen Amara is one of those left behind when her husband, Cal, drowns. Her story starts years after the Ranger disaster, but she's compelled to travel back to the February that persists in her mind. Until that moment in 1982, when expecting her fourth child, she receives the call informing her Cal is lost at sea. A quarter of a century on, late one winter's night, Helen is woken by another phone call. It's her wayward son John in another time zone on his way home. He has made her go pregnant and he wants Helen to decide what he should do. Because you're like not a grown man. As John grapples with what might mean to be a father, Helen realises she must shake off her decades of mourning in order to help. With grace and precision and a shocking ability to render the precise details of her character's physical and emotional worlds, Lisa Moore receives reveals the whole story to us and just as we finally watch the oil rig go down we see Helen emerge from a grief to greet a new life. Hmm, sounds interesting. Probably wouldn't pick it up because I, I tend to avoid things that have man booker, booker prize things because they tend to be a bit highbrow and I'm, I'm really not. Even though I'm reading War and Peace, I'm not. <gasps> War Horse! And it's a lovely edition. Wow, I haven't read it and it's illustrated. Oh, look at that. Fabulous. Oh, I look forward to this one. In the deadly chaos of the First World War, one horse witnesses the reality of battle from both sides of the trenches. Bombarded by artillery with bullets knocking riders from his back, Joey tells a powerful story of the truest friendships in the worst of wars. Wow, that is a really nice addition. We might be adding that to the permanent collection if I enjoy the story, and I'm sure I will. Oh, I'm glad. That's one I would like to read, yes. More Than You Can Say... Paul Torday. I like the cover. It's not exactly clean, but it's fine. Traumatised by a tour of duty in Iraq, Richard Gaunt returns home to his girlfriend with very little of a plan in mind. Finding it difficult to settle into civilian life, he turns to drink and gambling and is challenged to a bet he cannot resist. All he has to do is walk from London to Oxford in under 12 hours, but what starts as a harmless venture turns into something altogether different when Richard recklessly accepts an unusual request from a stranger. Ooh. So far, they're all sounding really interesting. Uh, Maureen Lee, Au revoir, Liverpool. Oh, this is one of the ones Mum like. These are like brand new. There's no breaking on this spine. I'm really, really pleased. The quality is absolutely amazing. I mean, some of them are a bit, you know, the, the Jeffrey Archer one's clearly been read and, and there's some stains on the, the Paul Torday one, but the condition is remarkable. So here we go. Liverpool 1937. Jessica is married to the mean-spirited Bertie, a man she only stays with for the sake of her children. To make up for her loveless marriages, marriage, she loses herself in romantic films at the local cinema. But when an unexpected glass of champagne is offered to her in a Liverpool hotel, the consequences are shattering. When Bertie discovers his wife's deceit, she's ruthless in his revenge, leaving Jessica devastated and alone. Still, she managed to exist, making a life for herself despite her broken heart. But when Jessica tries to help a friend return to Liverpool before the out break of wall, she finds herself stranded in Paris under German occupation where she somehow must find the courage to survive. I know that sounds interesting. My TBR is going to be 30 books higher isn't it because at the moment I have not seen one I haven't that I have read. Robert Goddard, Farmed Wanting. The car jolts to a halt at the pavement's edge, the driver waving through the windscreen to attract Richard's attention. He starts with astonishment. The driver is Gemma, his ex-wife. He's not seen or spoken to her for several years. They have, she memory assured him, nothing to say to each other. 
but something has changed her mind, something urgent. Immediately Richard is catapulted into a breathless race against time that takes him from London, across Northern Europe and into the heart of a mystery that reaches back into history, the fate of Anastasia and the last of the Romanovs. From that moment, Richard's life will be changed forever in ways he could not have imagined. That sounds good. Oh my God, I'm, I'm enjoying this box of books. What's this one? This one looks quite old. John le Carré, The Secret Pilgrim. Oh, the Berlin Wall is toppled, so it's at least 1989. The Iron Curtain swept aside. The secret pilgrim is Ned, a decent loyal soldier of the Cold War who has been in British intelligence, the circus, all his adult life. Now approaching the end of his career, he's forced to, by the explosions of change, to revisit his secret years. Ned illuminates the brave past and even braver present of the legendary George Smiley, his hero and mentor, who in one unforgettable evening gives back to him the dangerous edge of memory that cuts through Ned's self-delusion and empowers him finally to frame the questions that have haunted him and the world for 30 years. Oh, sounds all right. Books, I love them. And we've got, this is a big one, Elizabeth Jane Howard, Confusion. Got the cover, it's beautiful. Oh, there's nothing on the back. You can see where it's had something on it, uh, on it, 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 and it's gone. You know, it's gone lighter or it's gone darker. Um, it's a third book in the Caslet Chronicles, spring of 1942. It follows them through the middle period of War to VE Day. Polly and Clary have left home place to London, where Archie Lestrange keeps a close eye on them. Louise surprisingly has married. Polly makes a painful discovery. Zoe, despairing of Rupert's return, stumbles upon solace, while Edward's duplicity demands a reckoning. Okay, so I would assume that you could read it as a standalone, hopefully. And we've got The Dirty Bits for Girls, edited by India Knight. I just have a look. So it looks like this is bits from various novels, but just the dirty bits. So I'm not into smut and spice, but I will have a look at it just to see. <gasps> the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. This is a chunky one. I'm definitely keeping this one to add to my cl classics collection. The story of Edmund Edmond Dante, self-styled Count of Monte Cristo, is told with consummate skill. The victim of a miscarriage of justice, Dante is fired by a desire for retribution and empowered by a stroke of providence. In his campaign of vengeance, he becomes an anonymous agent of fate. The sensational narrative of intrigue, betrayal, escape and triumph revenge removes at a cracking pace. Oh, I'm glad that's in there. It's definitely worth a read. I'll add that, to, not until actually I've read, um, obviously, War and Peace, which I'm currently working on at the moment. We've got a thin one here. Evelyn Wall, the loved one, nice novella. So that's going to be a nice quick one. So if you're getting stuck with your Goodreads challenge, um, I'm, I'm ahead at the moment by one. So if I, if I feel I'm going to fall behind again, I can bang out a couple of these quick books. So following the death of a friend, poet and pets mortician Dave Dennis Barlow finds himself entering the artificial Hollywood paradise of the Whispering Glades Memorial Park with its Golden Gates death American style is wrapped up and sold like a package holiday. There, Dennis enters the fragile and bizarre world of Amy, the na naive Californian corpse beautician, and Mr. Joy Boy, the master of the embalmer's art. I think I'll like that. That sounds good. Then we've got another short one, modern classics, The Wide, Sa the Wide Sargasso Sea by Jean Rhys. Oh, I'm liking this. Small ones, but classics. Born into an oppressive colonial society, Creole heiress, heiress even, Antoinette Cosway meets a young English man who is drawn to her innocent sensuality and beauty. After their marriage, disturbing rumours begin to circulate poisoning her husband against her. Caught between his demands and her own precarious state of belonging, Antoinette is driven towards madness. Ooh. I'll keep an eye on the time because I've got to get Jennifer soon. <laughs> and then we've got The Forgotten Waltz by Anne Enright. Oh, this is a winner of the Man Booker Prize. Oh, hang on, let's have a look. And long-listed for the Orange Prize 2012. If it hadn't been for the child, then none of this might have happened. She saw me kissing her father. She saw her father kissing me. The fact a child got mixed up in it all made us feel that it mattered and there was no going back. Ooh. Again, it's another short one, which is great. Ooh, what's this? The Weekends of You and Me by Fiona Walker. Walker. T a decade, ten weekends, one love. I don't think I've read this one. 
When Jo Coulson finds herself single again in her 30s, she resigns her membership to the last of the hopeless romantics, fully intending to tackle midlife and motherhood alone. First, she plans one legendary last fling. In walks Harry Inchbold and the connection is electric. Passionate, unpredictable and messily divorced, Harry is the perfect antidote to cosy coupledom. Harry's tumble-down holiday cottage in the wilds of South Shropshire oh, is a beautiful place for a no-strings-attached weekend. But hidden away from the world, Harry reveals a very different side, melting Joe's resolve. At the end of their weekend, Harry and Joe promise to meet at the same time next year, but what will that year bring? Harry and Joe return to the Shropshire Hills one weekend each year to discover passion and make peace. As career, family and home crises all threaten to bring them unstuck, the cottage is their glue. Here different rules apply. The day-to-day -day world is not allowed to intrude. With Harry and Joe, however, it's only a matter of time before rules get broken. As real life gets increasingly complicated, can they keep renewing their promise? Well, sounds all right. We've got Black Ice. Do you know, I had a feel it was going to be called Black Ice. And it's by Matt Dickinson. It's a big paperback. Not so floppy. Deep beneath the Antarctic ice cap, scientist Lauren Burgess has discovered a secret which could change the face of human knowledge. Then a desperate Mayday call comes in. Two explorers are stranded out on the ice and a rescue is their only hope. Lauren is forced to put her groundbreaking scientific programme on hold as she leads the rescue mission to the frozen void. One of the dying men is Julian Fitzgerald, quintessential British hero and explorer of high repute. Fitzgerald is a PR dream and a man who stands to lose everything if the truth about his latest expedition failure is known. Winter is just days away and seven months of permanent night is about to fall across this coldest and most extreme of continents. The pressure of total isolation gradually takes its toll and as Fitzgerald's true dark nature is revealed, Lauren finds herself fighting, not just for the dram dramatic ecological discovery that has been her life's work, but the very lives of her team. Ooh, that sounds all right. So far, I'm very pleased with this book of box of books. Oh, then she was gone, Lisa Jewell. I might have this one. I might have read this one. I'm not sure. Let me have a look. She was 15, her mother's golden girl. She had her whole life ahead of her and then in the blink of an eye, Ellie was gone. Ten years on, Laurel has never given up hope of finding Ellie and then she meets a charming and charismatic stranger who sweeps off her feet. But re what really takes her breath away is she meets his nine-year-old daughter. Uh, because his daughter is the image of Ellie. Now all those unanswered questions of haunted Laurel come flooding back. What really happened to Ellie and who has secrets to hide? I don't think I have read that one. I will put it to the back where it's going to be ones I'm not sure of. Um, there's so many Lisa Jewell books on Kate Ellis, The Death Season. When D.I. Wesley Peterson is summoned to investigate a killing, he assumes that the case is a routine matter. But soon dark secrets and deadly deceptions start to emerge from the victim's past. And Wesley realises that a simple incident of cold-blooded murder is altogether more calculated and more complicated than he could ever imagine. Meanwhile, archaeologist Neil Watson is pulled from the historic Paradise Court to Sandrock, a ruined village from the First World War. Even with the help of the attractive and enigmatic Lucy, Neil cannot shake the feeling that something's missing from his exploration. A cryptic clue that might have been lost when Sandrock tumbled into the sea many years ago. A clue that could help Wesley solve his most puzzling case. Oh. As more victims fall prey to a faceless killer, Wesley sees the investigation affecting him more personally than ever before. And when his precious family becomes a target, Wesley has no time to lose. Just like the falling village of Sandrock, Wesley will have to stand tall if he's withstand the coming storm. That sounds good. These are all, I'm really pleased. Ooh, what's this one? We have got Mrs. England by Stacey Halls. It's lost some of its foiling. Bit of, bit of creaser, but that's nothing wrong with this. Something's not right here, in the house, with the family. Ooh. West Yorkshire, 1904, when newly graduated nurse Ruby May takes a position looking after the children of Charles and Lily in England, a wealthy couple from a powerful dynasty of mill owners, she hopes it will be the fresh start she needs. But as she accepts life at the isolated Hardcastle house, it becomes clear there's something not quite right about the beautiful, mysterious Mrs England. Ostracised by the other servants and feeling increasingly uneasy, soon a series of strange events will force Ruby to question everything she thought she knew. Again, I am amazed by this. This is great. What have we got here? On Cape Three Points, Christopher Wakelin. It's a funny title, On Cape Three Points. Let's see what it's about. 13 days ago I made a mistake, a momentary slip, but enough to launch me into freefall, a life unravelling in my wake. 
So begins the story of Lewis Penn, a young business lawyer whose currency is mind-numbing detail, whose skill is keeping to the middle of the road. He's never put a foot wrong until now. Entrusted with a file of confidential papers, Lewis loses them, an oversight that threatened his career, his sanity, and ultimately his identity. Every step Lewis takes to cover up his mistake propels him further off course and into a comprehensible world of Ukrainian mafia and industrial spies. Increasingly paranoid, Lewis can only confide in his dying brother Dan, but as the facade of Lewis's life cracks, it seems like Dan's is also riven by deception. Lewis's faltering trajectory takes him from London to Washington DC and Cape Three Points, where a pivotal moral decision catapults them into free fall. Hmm, okay, sounds interesting. I've, I've never heard of it. Um, well, never heard of most of these. Um, this one looks quite fun. This is a cosy look. Rachel's Pudding Pantry by Caroline Roberts. I like Caroline Roberts. I've read a few of hers, but not this one. Primrose Farm is Rachel's very own slice of heaven. Come rain or shine, there's always a pot of tea brewing by the Arga. The delicious aroma of freshly baked puddings and a chorus of happy memories uh, drifting through the kitchen. But the farm is in a spot of trouble. As the daffodils spring, Rachel must plant the seeds of change if she wants to keep her farm afloat. And it's all rested on a crazy pan. She'll need one family cookbook her mum Jill's baking magic, and the reason to avoid her distractingly gorgeous neighbour Tom. Swapping their wellies for aprons, can Rachel and Jill bake their way to a brighter future? The proof will be in the pudding. Oh, yeah, I like the sound of that one. Then, oh, we've got Joanna Trollope, the rector's wife. For 20 years, Anne Bouvery, as a priest's wife, £9,000 a year in a red brick rectory that looked like a bus shelter, had served God and the parish in a diversity of ways. She'd organised the deanery suppers, made cakes for the brownies Easter cake bake, delivered parish magazines and washed and ironed her husband's surpluses, not altogether perfectly according to Mr Dunstable. Grown her own vegetables and clothed herself and her children in leftover jumbo sale items. When her husband failed to gain promotion to Archdeacon and retreated into isolated bitterness and the bullying of a younger daughter at the local comprehensive school reached and endurable proportions, Anna suddenly rebelled. Taking a job in the local supermarket, she earned money, a sense of her own worth, the shocked disapproval of the parish and the icy fury of her husband. As her loneliness and isolation increased, she was observed with passionate interest by three significant men, each of whom was to play a role in the part traffic, part triumphant blossoming of Anne's life. Joe Nesbo, The Snowman. I haven't read it. I'm not sure if I've got it. I don't think so. I've got a few Joe Nesbos on my uh, list to read, so I'm hoping this isn't one of them. A young boy wakes to find his mother missing. The house is empty, but outside in the garden he sees his mother's favourite scarf wrapped around the neck of a snowman. As Harry Hall and his team begin their investigation, they discover an alarming number of wives and mothers have gone missing over the years. When a second woman disappears, it seems that Harry's worst suspicions are confirmed. For the first time in his career, Harry finds himself confronted with a serial killer operating on his own turf. Ooh, I like it. We've only got four more left. Kate Atkinson, Case Histories. I have got some Kate Atkins, Atkinson, but not this one. Cambridge is sweltering during an unusually hot summer. It's hot here at the moment. Uh, to Jackson Brody, former police inspector turned private investigator of the world, consists of one accounting sheet lost on the left, found on the right, and the two never seem to balance. Surrounded by death, intrigue, and misfortune, his own life haunted by a family tragedy, Jackson attempts to unravel three disparate disparate case histories. I'm going to realise that in spite of apparent diversity, everything is connected. Sounds all right. Try that one. All right, let's have a look. Oh, Francis Fifield. Perfectly pure and good. And again, it's a, not a huge one. When Sarah Fortune, with her impeccable qualifications and chequered history, is sent to a small seaside town in Norfolk, she goes willingly. Sorting out the inheritance problems of the Pardos, Merton on Sea's premier family, promises to dis her from a claustrophobic relationship with Malcolm Cook. Sarah cannot bear to be a captive, but she soon discovers that guilt, insecurity, unrequited love and a touch of insanity affect the Pardos and, and the town. The legacy of a suicide which took place two years before, when Elizabeth Tysall, a beautiful woman with an uncanny resemblance to Sarah herself, walked into the sea and never came back. More immediately, Merton chooses, chooses to ignore another part of the legacy, the white-haired figure some call a ghost and others call a vagrant who roams the beach and haunts the town, harmlessly, until he insinuates himself into the power struggle of the Pardo children and becomes the mysterious and cunning enemy of all concerned. Mm, sounds good. Two more. And the next one is Kate Ellis, the Shroud Maker. 
A year on from the mysterious disappearance of Jenny Percival, D.I. Wesley Peterson is called in when the body of a strangled woman is found floating out to sea in South Devon. The discovery mars the festivities of the Palkin Festival held each year to celebrate the life of John Palkin, a 14th century mayor of Trademouth who made his fortune from trade and piracy. It seems like death and mystery have returned to haunt the town. When archaeologist Neil Watson makes a grim discovery on the site of Palkin's warehouse, it looks as if history might have inspired a killer. It's only by delving into the past that Wesley can come close to uncovering the truth. Yes, yes, yes. That's right up my alley. All these books are really good. And the last one is Mark Twain, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This one I have read. I read it years ago as a kid, but I'm happy to have it to have a reread, so I will keep it. There's nothing going to the charity shop. I'm so sorry. We said there wasn't no home like a raft after all. Other places do seem so cramped up and smothery, but a raft don't. You feel mighty free and easy and comfortable on a raft. Huck Finn escapes from his alcoholic father by faking his own death and so begins his journey through the deep south seeking independence and freedom. On his travel Huck meets an escaped slave Jim who's a wanted man and together they journey down the Mississippi River raising the timeless and universal issues of prejudice, bravery and hope. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I haven't read that for years, so I will be happy to reread that. So those are all the books I got in my box for £30. What do you think? Good selection? I think they're a really good selection, especially as there's only one I've read, and that was years ago, so... Excited to get started. Uh, you won't be seeing these again uh, in a haul at the end of the month, because you've already seen them, there's no point. Um, if I get any more books, <laughs> please don't. I'll do a haul, but I, it may not be one this month, so I need to try and get the TBR down slightly. Anyway, that's it from me, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.